sure how to start the sermon today. Uh, isn't that a great way to start off? Now you're truly going to want to listen. Um, I want to talk to the gospel reading, which is about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. I want to hook it into another passage of scripture. Uh, but I also want to link it in with sort of uh, a personal experience that maybe you'll be able to identify with. In fact, I hope you are able to identify with. Uh, so that's where I'm going to start, and I hope everything all glues together. I, I think it will. Um, long, long time ago, long, long time ago, uh, I, I, I got a call from Bishop Reg Hollis, um, who was my bishop at the time. And uh, those of you who know Reg, I've said this before, but not everybody knows, Reg was like, he, he had trouble getting two words together. Like, he, he was a very, very quiet man, and conversations on the phone with Reg go something like this. Hi, Bishop, how are you? You sort of wonder what he's doing, like, he's taking me into dark. Lord. Yeah, and it goes on like this. It's like, ah, you know? Um, anyway, it always, like, Reg was, was great. I loved him. And he, 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 was, he was a fantastic bishop. Um, and, and I always felt with him that he had my interest at heart and the parish's interest at heart. He really, really did. He was, he was a wonderful man. On this particular occasion, it was, I believe, January of uh, 1989. Um, he had called me up in Mescouche. Um, but you know that when the bishop calls us up, it's up. And he told me that there was a parish that was going to be coming vacant, and he'd like me to consider it. Um, I had lived in Indiji all my life, which is sort of middle class. When I was ordained, I was sent to the suburbs, and it was like, oh, God, uh, trees, grass, parks, ew, uh, uh, that's, that just wasn't me. Uh, he sent me to Dollar and Pierrefort and stuff like that. Like, suburban people came from there. Uh, but I fell in love in the suburbs. And then I was transferred to St. George's for two years in St. Anne in Bellevue, and I fell in love there, you know, uh, with the people in the church and, and the area. Uh, so I, I kind of began to fancy myself a, a, a suburban type guy. And then when it was time to become rector of my own parish, um, he had combined Montreal North and Muscouche into one parish unit because neither were able to sustain themselves. Um, and he tagged me. So I'd been there for seven years, and I'd been very happy there. Um, it was one inner city parish, one ex-Serbia becoming suburbia, and it was, it, was, it was always challenging, always stimulating, and, and wherever you go as a minister, there's always lovely people. Um, and so, I, I, I was enjoying myself. We were just completing a building, we built our own building in Muskush, and I thought maybe I'd like to enjoy it for a little while, it would be a tough two years while we were building it. Um, but no, he called and asked if I would Now, one of the things when you're a minister is, even if you don't feel like it, uh, you gotta at least turn off the video. You gotta at least <laughs> pretend you're open to God. Um, and and I, I, I'm not sure truly how open I was to the notion of the move, but I felt that like uh, he, he wanted me to consider this parish, and so I had to at least think about it and pray about it, which I did. And then I met with the selection committee from this place, but prior to that, uh, a lady called me up. Uh, some of you will remember the name, her name was Pat Roberts. And one of the things when the parish is looking for a priest, and the priest is considering, uh, the parish selection committee is sent by the bishop to various churches to sort of spy out the, the, the you know, the meat. Um, and so, uh, Pat and uh, Claire Parsons, who I didn't know at that point, I don't think, um, and Reg Reese, who was one of the wardens, um, was coming up to Mascouche to sort of see how I did things. Um, and Pat, who knew me for years, and Pat being a very unique and wonderful individual, uh, the night before she was to come up, she called and called the director and said, Lauren, I think all this secrecy is nonsense. I'm coming up to see you on Sunday, we're looking for a minister, and I think you should be in. You're my choice already, I just wanted you to know. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Pressure! <laughs> you know, so try to get up and do a normal sermon when you know the, 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 the spies are in the land. Anyway, uh, so they came up and, um, I, I gotta say, I didn't really feel a terrific amount of openness. Uh, this parish uh, didn't strike me at that time as my demographic, uh, nor did it strike me as the type of place that would be benefited by a priest, my type of personality, my skill set, and my interests. I, 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 I didn't think that. Uh, but I met with the committee, and uh, I was surprised uh, after the meeting, um, when 
6 o'clock the next morning, um, it was, yeah, uh, I got a call from Reg Hollows. Um, and he had spoken with the representatives of the committee the night before. Um, and he said, you are their choice, uh, so it's up to you. Uh, he says, I, I, I want you to go there. Um, and they want you, uh, but it's up to you. Uh, and that really put me in a, in a, in a pickle. Um, because on the one hand, I was attractive. On the other hand, I really wanted, I was happy where I was. I really was. Uh, Mass which is, it was just wonderful. Montreal Art, a lot of really wonderful things that happened. It, it, it would be nice to just sort of reap the peace and joy for a while after a bunch of years of hard work. Um, and, and so there were all these conflicting feelings going on inside. I conflicted feelings going on inside. But I, I, I did have to seriously consider it and did pray about it. I thought that the selection committee was a bit naive because uh, the criteria in the parish profile seemed to me a little unrealistic and a little Pollyannish uh, for a rather conservative, well, middle class West Island suburban parish at that point. One of the things, as I think a lot of you know, that struck me as particularly odd but interesting was that a third of the criteria had to do with ongoing youth work. Um, the parish had had the experience of typical, you know, start a youth group, see who shows up, nobody still shows up, and get depressed. Start a youth group, two people show up, it runs for six weeks and then collapses. That's, that's the traditional history of churches and youth work. Um, but they, they were very clear there. You know, they would like youth ministry of year-to-year -year continuity. And I asked the, the, the selection committee, do you know what you're saying here? Because to have a strong youth ministry parish has to change. Uh, it can't be the type of place that says, we welcome youth as long as you become just like us. Um, and the service, what happens on Sunday, has to be conducive as well, etc., etc., etc. But they understood that. They really did. Uh, and they also told me that they knew that the price of growth was going to be changed. Um, so I was ambivalent. I was ambivalent. And I wish I was holier than I am, you know. I probably for all of us. Um, but I did pray, and I did offer the whole situation to God, and I did sort of go on a mini retreat, um, just thinking about things and reading the Bible and, 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 and spending some time. Um, and what I was trying to do in my brain was sort of the difference, and this is where it's actually going to start turning into a sermon, okay? Uh, I was trying to sort out the difference between the leading of the Spirit and the temptation. Because sometimes temptation, because temptation is tempting, right? It's designed to fit us. Sometimes temptation feels really good. And temptation can feel like leading. That's certainly my experience. And I don't think I'm any different from anybody else in that way. And the leading of the Spirit can be somewhere where you don't necessarily think you might want to go. So an authentic leading of the Spirit doesn't necessarily come with a basket full of happy, you know. Uh, it can come with a sense of challenge and insecurity and even anxiety, at least until you know it's where you're supposed to be and then things start to change a bit. So this thing about temptation and leading, I've, 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 I've had a struggle with. Um, the upshot of the story, obviously, duh, here I am, um, was that uh, I, I, I could see that some people who were really wise, no, uh, were really wise, and, and people who were knowledgeable and thoughtful, thought this was going to be something good. So I, I, I came to the realization that there's something that maybe I just wasn't seeing, um, but I sort of tried to put my ambivalence on hold of and really see whether this was something that God wanted for me. And the conclusion that I came to first, and this says more about my personality than anything theological, so don't look at this as a sign of God in your life. I came first to the conclusion that I couldn't say that God didn't want me to go to St. Mary's. Okay, so that made me feel a little better. And then I began to get what I sometimes describe as sort of a tickle in the spirit, where you start, these thoughts start coming into your brain as to what's possible, what can happen. And on that basis decided. And it was prayer, it was thought, it was reading the Bible, it was talking to people, it was all that. It was a sort of retreat, even though I didn't go to a monastery or convent anywhere, you know, uh, for my retreat. It was, it was still a like retreat. And so I understand really clearly that there are times for all of us in our lives 
when you just need to, to clear the clutter and turn off the radio, the TV, the CD player, blah, 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 blah. just clear the clutter, clear the static, is just not hearing the voices that loud. And when you look at the Gospel reading for this morning, you see Jesus doing exactly that. He's receiving a call from God. And if you want to argue this with him, we can argue it. Um, but Jesus was fully human as well as fully divine. So Jesus experienced in his life times of confusion, times of uncertainty, times of doubt, times of fear, anger. He experienced everything that it means to be human. And so before he started his public ministry, we see him going off into the desert on a retreat. And you see Jesus wrestling with the issue in his life of what's a leading and what's a temptation. Okay? And that's what I already read about this morning. Before developing that, and I, I do want to develop that, um, words of reassurance. When it comes to leading or temptation, um, just as it was for Jesus, there are only three categories, if you will, three umbrellas uh, under which all human temptation, or temptation of humans count. Only three. So if you figure these out, and you learn to live your life, not in fear of temptation and sin, but aware, then really think that what you'll experience is something that is transformative. And in order to talk about this, I want to go right back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, and the story of the garden. And I'm not going to unfold the whole thing, you know it. And different people read that differently. Some people believe that Genesis is, is literally historically true. Uh, some people believe it is merely metaphor. Some people believe it is spiritual truth uh, wrapped up in a story. However you believe it, you know, if you want to ask me, you know, well, all right, that, that's fine, but that's not what the sermon is about. But what we see is a story where there is a man and a woman representing the whole of humanity, um, and we ain't any different than they were, uh, representing the whole of humanity, divinely created in the image of God, with the spark of the divine within them. They were alive, and one of the terms in the Bible for the Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life. So, fact is, they were animated by the Spirit of God, they were created by God, uh, the, the Word became flesh, so everything that exists is because of the Word, so you got the Trinitarian thing going on there, and you got Adam and Eve, and you also got evil, you got temptation. And so the story, that I want, the part of the story I want to focus on is exactly that, the temptation. Um, for reasons that maybe you can ask him when you die, God chose to plant a tree, uh, metaphorically or literally, how can you take it, I'm not going to say that anymore now, I'm just going to talk. Uh, in the garden. It, it, it was a fruit-bearing tree. And God said, uh, everything that is here, everything there is, is for you and for your stewardship. Um, the one thing that I'm saying to you is that that tree, you're not to eat. You're not to eat the fruit. Leave that tree alone. And, well, you know, I have kids, a lot of you have kids. Just tell them they can't have that. They may not have wanted it. As soon as you say they can't have it, they won't. Um, and so I have, a, I have a feeling that from then on, Adam and Eve, whenever they go around that tree, they look at it. And if God hadn't said anything, the temptation wouldn't be there. But he'd said it, and, you know, don't touch the paint. Keep off the grass. You know, that's, that's the way we are. And so on this particular occasion, the story, um, I was going to say it's embellished, that's not what I meant mean to say. The, the story gets filled out. And so you got this image of Eve there. And the temptation is about to happen. And the Bible uses the image of the serpent. And that is a Middle Eastern image that represents evil in some circumstances, death in others, and all the rest of it. It's a common Middle Eastern image. And the serpent to describe the embodiment of evil, of Satan. And so Eve is there, and there's a discussion taking place. You know, uh, did God really say? Like, what did God really say? Hey, that was not a good politician, but that's another story, okay? Uh, what did God really say? Let's parse God's grammar here, because maybe, you know, you, you're not quite understanding yourself. God said we can't touch it, or we can't, we can't even look at it, first and say. She took God's words and added to it. That's God said. So we're, we're, we're not allowed, no, 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 no. But there's an interesting phrase there. But when she did look at the tree and look at its fruit, 
there are three terms to describe what she saw in her life. It says, she saw that the fruit was good to eat, lovely to look at, and able to make a man wise. Isn't that great? So she's looking, it's not an apple tree, they don't say what type of fruit it is, you know. Um, but she's looking at a fruit tree. And all of what she's got is, it's just fruit. She could have gone to Loblaws. No, I'm kidding. Um, but it's just fruit. But it's not just fruit. Because as human beings, when we see something, we imbue it with value. Okay? And so she put value in there. That, that really, really looks like a tasty fruit. Even though God's actually doing Pretty. Lovely to look at. That is a fruit in all its glory. It is the <coughs> perfection of ripeness. Look at the colors of it. It's just beautiful. Lovely to look at. And it's the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's able to make a man wise. So clearly, if I eat that fruit, I'm even better off now than what I have now. Good to eat. Lovely to look at. Able to make a man wise. Here's a challenge, and I probably will leave about 15 seconds. I'm not looking for feedback here. Try to think of any temptation that you have been tempted with in your life that doesn't appeal to one of those categories. All temptation falls into the category of good to eat. It appeals to your senses. There's something sensual about this particular temptation, whatever it is. And I won't go on any further there. Lovely to look at. Just turn on your television for 10 minutes when you go home. See if you can find E or Entertainment Tonight or any of those shows. There is so much of that form of idolatry in, in, in our society. Lovely to look at. Don't get me wrong here. You know, not everything good to eat is bad. Not everything well to look at is bad. But there's a difference between being led somewhere and being tempted. Okay? And I only put that in to remind you where I come from in the sermon where I'm going to be. And then able to make man wise. Oh, we all want to be held in esteem by our spouse, by our kids, by our friends, by our neighbors, by our boss, by our employees, by our doctor, by our golf partners, you know, we all want to be held in esteem. And whether you choose to use the word wisdom to describe that, there is something in each and every one of us that wants people to look up to us, to admire us, to respect us, maybe not to put us up on a pedestal, oh, yeah, we all want to be up on a pedestal. We just want our feet crazy to two pedestals so we don't fall. Okay? So that's the temptation in the book of Genesis. Good to eat. Lovely to look at, able to make a man wise. And that right in the book, in the first book of the Bible, in the first real story of the Bible, is something that's going to be a theme throughout all of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. When you look at the rise and fall of some of the kings, you'll see it. You'll see it in their quest for power. And sometimes it's starting out with God, then going their own way. When you see David, Standing and looking at Bathsheba, and, and he lusts after her. Uh, is he see it there? The, you know, lovely to look at. When you see it in breaking into the temple to steal the bread from the, the, the through the Lord's bread, uh, all the way through the Old Testament, you'll see that the people of Israel and their leadership continue again and again and again to fall into one of these three temptations. Good to eat. Lovely to look at, able to make a man wise. I can throw something in here that I'm not going to develop. One of the temptations to come to St. Mary's, one of the temptations that clergy face is that parish has more prestige than that parish. When I came to St. Mary's, one of the nuns who attended the induction service came up to me after this lovely one. She said, you've got a really plum parish now. And it made me sad. Maybe she didn't know me. Maybe because she didn't know the parish. And see, but she was wrong. Anyway, that's the way it is in our human experience. 
Okay? It shouldn't then surprise us that when Jesus goes into the desert before starting his public ministry, the temptations that he faces correspond. You can't just sort of line it up like DNA things, but correspond with the exact three set of temptations uh, that Eve went through and that we go through. Just think of the first thing that happened. Jesus goes out into the wilderness. It said 40 days. Like 40 days is a long period of time. Nobody was ever counted. Uh, might be 32, might be 49. We don't, but 40 days, long period of time. We're not just talking about the clergy Lenten retreat where you show up Sunday night and leave Tuesday morning having eaten in the cafeteria. Blah, 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 blah. We're talking about a serious, a serious thing here. He's being baptized. The Spirit has descended on him. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Take to heart what he's going to tell you. In other words, listen to him. Take to heart what he's going to tell you. So all that's gone on. Jesus is ready, you know. He's, he's ready to be launched. He's ready to begin his public ministry. And he goes away on this retreat. After a period of time like that, you're going to be hungry. You know, in fact, I wish the kids that had been here, like, guys, guys, it was basically one night and one day. Uh, Jesus, we're talking for their starving line. We're talking 40 days here. So, and then it says, and afterward, he was unhungered. That's the King James Version. He was and hungered. Um, okay, come on. Uh, that's really nice and boy. The devil appears. The tempter. The one who knows the cracks and crevices to work in and get you. Um, and isn't it good for us? Isn't it reassuring that Jesus was tempted? That it's not like he was a superhero because he was Jesus and had all this like sort of horse meat that kept it all at bay. No, no, no. The temptation for him was real. It was real, just like our temptations are real. And the first one, it's good to eat. Jesus, come on, man, you're God. Oh, no, that would be some, I don't know, but a different type of devil. But that's what it was. Jesus, you are, Jesus, take these stones, turn them to bread. Why should you be hungry? Come on. You're just doing God's work. You can't do God's work on an empty stomach. Come on, turn these stones into bread. First temptation. It's good to eat. Jesus accepted it, quoted scripture. Okay, he did that three times, but I'm only going to say it that one time. So the first thing was, Jesus, you're hungry. You don't need to endure, the, endure this. Turn these stones into bread. Jesus resisted. Then, there's another thing, and this is almost like, I wonder sometimes whether Charles Dickens made a Christmas carol, and Scrooge going around to these different incarnations based on Jesus' temptations. There's, 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 there's parallels. I just distracted myself, sorry. Um, Jesus is taken to a high place, and uh, sees all the kingdoms of the world, all the kingdoms of the world. And I suspect, and I'm not saying this is in the Bible, but I suspect that when Jesus saw the kingdoms of the world, it wasn't just the kingdoms then, it was all the kingdoms that were to come. You know, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Jesus was given a vision of what was and what was to come. And hey, this could all be yours. You don't have to go through the road that God's calling you to. It's gonna be rugged. You're gonna bleed and you're gonna die and you're gonna suffer. You're gonna Hurt. It's not going to be any fun, Jesus. But if you'll switch your alliance to me, I'm going to give it all to you. Because God has surrendered his authority over this to me. So it's now mine. Oh, yeah, the devil always has his fingers crossed, by the way. He says, never tell him the whole truth. Just, just, just do it. Just do it. So there's a temptation there. There's a temptation to do God's things, God's thing, in ungodly ways. There's a temptation to get love in the wrong ways. There's a temptation to get money in the wrong way. There's a temptation, well, to eat in a way that destroys. There's a temptation to drink in a way that destroys, not just your body, relationships as well. 
is a way to play political games that plays into the destructive system rather than challenging it. There's even a way to work for social justice that isn't righteous. And that's a good phrase, actually. I thought that was one of the better ones in my preparation. There's a way to work for social justice that isn't righteous. And that's what Jesus is being tempted to do. Switch your alliance. Try to accomplish good goals using bad methods. And he's told, he's tempted to believe that that will work to accomplish God's purpose. But it never will. And then the third thing is about the sensational. Um, and again, I'm paralleling this with the last thing in, 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 in Genesis, able to make man wise. So I, I'm playing a little bit loosey-goosey with this one, but the, the, the idea of being up on a pedestal, being admired, being held in esteem, you know? We all want to be held in esteem. We want to be considered wise and knowledgeable, special, and that's that, that. And in one sense, that's the temptation, the, the last temptation, the final one we're talking about. The, the, Jesus is led up to the pinnacle of the temple, and of course, in his time, the temple is the highest building uh, around. He was led up to the pinnacle of the temple, and it was, okay, Jesus, here's the thing. They're only going to follow you if you do something sensational to get their attention. Just preaching about love and all this stuff, it doesn't matter how much you live it. doesn't matter how many unclean women you hug. It doesn't matter how many disciples you call from their nets. It doesn't matter how many tax collectors' houses you eat in. It doesn't matter. You know, if you don't give them something sensational, they just won't follow you. So here's what you're going to do, Jesus. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to stand at the highest point of the temple on Passover. It had to be Passover. When the city is teeming with people from near and from far, what would be a better time? It's not just the local yokels, it's everybody gathered there. So people are going to talk all around civilization. The whole of the Roman Empire is going to hear what you're going to do, Jesus. You're going to stand up there and you're going to jump off the temple. And people are going to look up at you falling and they are going to start screaming because they are expecting a splat. And then just before you hit the ground, just stop time. Stop time. That's all you have to do. Jesus, you are the Lord of time. You're the incarnate word. You're the one through whom everything came to be. You were there before the, the, the universe came into being. You're there before the earth was spinning uh, on its axis around the sun. You were there before days were invented. You're the Lord of time. So, stop time. And come down. And then we start it. And they will all look at you in awe and amazement at the miraculous thing that you have done. And they will respect you, they will admire you, they'll even be a little afraid of you. They'll be in awe. Surely then they will follow you. And Jesus said, No. He resisted them, He resisted the temptation. There was the crack in his armor, because he was just as human as he was divine, fully human and fully divine. So the temptation was real. It's not just a game to teach us a story. It was really real. The temptation to do God's work in ungodly ways. But he resisted that temptation. And because he resisted that temptation, and the other two, he came out of the desert, came up to the people, and started talking. Days coming, it will be a time of accounting and reckoning. When good will be good, evil will be evil, and we'll be able to discern the difference. But until that final consummation, here's what's going to be, folks. It's going to be the way of love. And that love is sacrificial. It's not going to capitulate to evil. It's not going to try to do divine things in ungodly ways. It's not going to succumb to the temptations of the flesh, or the temptations of the eye, or the temptations of the mind. Because that's what it's all about. It will be intentionally and deliberately discerning the will of God for your lives. And whether you were a disciple hearing that call on a beach bending your neck, or whether you're a priest in 1989 trying to figure out 
Am I being tempted or led to St. Mary's? Whether you're somebody trying to figure out who's the right person to date, or when's the right time to retire, or what's the right job to have, or should I keep my mouth shut or should I speak at this particular time? Should I, well, we can all fill in our own shoulds. What Jesus did was through being empowered himself, empower us to be able to discern God's will for our lives and to follow it. It is a process, it is a journey, but it is possible if we dedicate ourselves to God in his ways. So let's make that our mountain journey. Amen. Amen. Now let's pray. God, we thank you for the hope that we have uh, in, in and through Jesus, that just like us, he shows us a way through and gives us the power of his spirit to, like him, be able to discern what is godliness and what is ungodly. Give us the gift of discernment in all our daily doings. God, it's easy sometimes in the, in the, in the holy times, in the religious times, to know what to do. It's just in the everyday stuff. So may we see with your eyes, hear with your ears, think with your mind, and love with your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.